Welcome to this very special edition of Razorback Reels. I'm Elena Thompson. And I'm Riley Atkinson. Thanks for joining us. Taylor Swift is a pop culture icon. She is the music industry and she is currently touring on the country with her Eras Tour. Taylor has been releasing new albums and revisiting old ones for the past couple of years, so we thought it was finally time to do a Razorback Reels Taylor's version show. Tonight, we'll be journeying through all 10 years of her iconic eras from country to pop to folk. Taylor really has done it all, and it doesn't seem like she's stopping anytime soon. But first, we're throwing you back all the way to 2006, when a teenage girl from Pennsylvania found a place in this world. We have Kai Kocher in studio to explain why one should have said no to a star in the making. Taylor Swift made her debut in 2006 at the age of 17. She was the youngest artist to write and release a number one hot country song. Some of my earliest memories are listening to Taylor Swift, more specifically, our song as I rode the bus to school and heard every girl on the bus singing it out loud with a thick country accent. I'm from a very small southern town where the only music that is played is country. And debut is full of songs that I don't know how you couldn't know. I've never met a person who can at least sing the chorus to our song or Picture to Burn. And speaking of Picture to Burn, have you ever listened to that song in the car with the windows down with all of your best friends? Well, I highly encourage you to do so, especially if your ex-boyfriend drives a pickup truck. At the time it was released, I feel like it helped raise a lot of girls and take them from being a young girl to a young woman. It gave so many Swifties a place to enjoy falling in love, but also allowed them to feel teardrops on the guitar when heartbreak sank in. As I graduate college, I've grown to love the song, A Place in This World about a girl who isn't sure which direction she will take in life, but knows that she will figure it out. Thank you, Ms. Swift, for creating an album that me and so many others have grown with since we were riding the bus to elementary school. Reporting for Razorback Reels, I'm Kai Kocher. Thanks, Kai. Revisiting these old eras has brought us back to the early 2000s, a time when Disney Channel stars ruled the world and the MP3, pile in the MP3 file ruined the music industry. <laughs> yeah, so we have Drew Chamberlain in studio to tell us about all Taylor's early years in the industry. Thanks, Riley. Hey, Razorbacks. I'm Drew Chamberlain, and the Fearless era was one to never forget. Taylor's impact then is still felt today. Coincidentally, Joe Jonas's impact is also still being felt today. Sorry, Drew, but I think we've heard enough about Mr. Perfectly Fine for the night. Yeah, we don't want to spend forever and always talking about the boy who broke her heart in only 25 seconds over the phone. Moving on from that outdated love story, we have Jenna Swope in studio to take us back to 2008. So put on your cowboy boots and jump in head first, fearless into this new area. I was only five years old when Taylor Swift's Fearless album was released in 2008 but that doesn't change the fact that it is my favorite album and holds a special place in my heart. The Fearless Era has three versions of the album, the original, a deluxe version, and Taylor's version. Fearless Taylor's version is her first re-recorded album. She is planning on re-recording her first six albums to own her own work after her masters were sold. Taylor's version brought six new songs out of the vault. I am so glad she decided to not gate gatekeep Mr. Perfectly Fine from us anymore. Taylor is a lyricist, and this album is a prime example of this. Fearless has the songs to fit every part of love, and as a certified lover girl myself, what more could I ask for? The young love, the heartbreak, the first kiss feeling, and everything in between. The album opens with the iconic Fearless title track. This is a song that any girl who has fallen head first for a boy can relate to. Songs like Today Was a Fairy Tale and Love Story detail the exciting feeling of slowly falling in love with someone. The beauty of this album is the several love songs, but what makes me love this album even more is it offers the songs for when the love turns to heartbreak. Breathe, forever and always, and the way I loved you highlight what it feels like to have your heart broken by your first love. Anytime I need to feel something, I listen to this album and bring myself back to being 15, falling for the boy on the football team. In this era, she won four Grammys and made history as the youngest winner of Album of the Year. This album also featured several iconic music videos for songs such as You Belong With Me and Love Story. Taylor Swift said Fearless is an album about the fearlessness of falling in love no matter how many times you get hurt. You will always fall in love again with someone new. I am and always have been in In My Fearless Era. For Razorback Reels, I'm Jenna Swope. 
Thanks for bringing us all back to elementary school with that revisit of the Fearless era, Jenna. Okay, so Riley, do you like Country Taylor? I mean, yes. Me too. I don't think you can really call yourself a Taylor Swift fan if you don't like I her think country. I, agree. I fully <laughs> Especially agree. Especially Fearless, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I fully agree. I think Fearless really was like her step out of the door. I mean, I feel like we can all agree with that. She won our album of the year that year. Mm -hmm. She won a Grammy that year for Fearless. And I don't know, I just love her. So what is your favorite vault song on the Fearless Taylor's version? Oh gosh, version? you're putting on me on the spot right I know. Now. I'm like, I can't even remember what songs are what. I know. But the That's the Way I Love You is literally one of my favorite okay, songs. Okay, that's first, so true. Okay, ever. something that I think is so underrated is Forever and Always Piano version. I yes. love that song. Oh, that is such a good I song. I am just such a Forever and Always stan, though. That is one of my favorite songs of all time ever. Not even just my favorite Taylor Swift song. It's just one of the best of all time. Um, but for her vault tracks, I really like Mr. Perfectly Fine. Oh, that's I, a good one. Mm -hmm, I think it's a fun one, and I know it's kind of basic from her vault tracks, but I really just think and it's... Basic is okay. It's because it's good. I know. It's it popular. is because it's good. <laughs> it's very popular, and it's for a reason. Mm -hmm. But coming up, we're enchanted to begin again with two more era recaps. Stay tuned. <laughs> Welcome back to Razorback Reels, Taylor's version. Taylor Swift is in the process of her re-recording the first six albums, and these next two eras have the, brought the biggest buzz surrounding her re-records. But first, we have Drew Chamberlain back in studio to set a time and place for these beloved eras. Now, 2010 was the year Taylor entered her Speak Now era, and it was also her first worldwide tour. It just so happens John Mayer is currently also on his solo tour. Oh, Drew, I think the story of us working together on reels is coming to an end if you keep talking about Dear John. Sorry, woulda, coulda, shoulda. Let's drop everything now, because this next era is filled with name dropping, theatrical storytelling, and the color purple, of course. Debuting at number one on the Billboard 200 in October of 2010, Speak Now is an album written entirely by Taylor herself while she was touring her Fearless album. Speak Now, in my opinion, is her coming-of-age, golden-era album. She's matured in her writing and her vocals and is in her own personal coming-of-age era while she's entering her 20s. Five songs on the album are over five minutes in length with powerful verses and iconic bridges that still hit the same way they did 13 years ago. Oh, hey, 13. Songs on the album touch on a range of different topics while keeping the emotional confessions theme. I love the magic and the storytelling element of this album, and that's why the title track, Speak Now, is my favorite song on the album. The idea of standing up in the middle of a wedding and actually speaking now is something only Taylor could think to write a song about. Taylor had an iconic moment at the 2012 Grammys when she called out the media outlets and people who would spread rumors and talk negatively about her. Someday, I'll be singing this Arguably the most special song for fans in all of Taylor's discography is on this album, Long Live. This nearly five and a half minute song is one that Swifties generations from now will be listening to. Speak Now is one of four of Taylor's albums left to be re-recorded and currently has the most speculation of mo among fans that it'll be the next re-release. I think all the Speak Now stands, including myself, lost it when the Bejeweled music video premiered and there were countless Easter eggs pointing towards Speak Now being the next re-record. From the speak not at the beginning to the purple number three elevator button she pushes, she had me fully convinced I'd be hearing Back to December Taylor's version soon. We still have other albums that haven't been re-recorded, but for now, I'm hoping she'll drop everything now. For Razorback Reels, I'm Madison Smith. Thanks, Madison, for bringing us back in time so we never grow up. The Speak Now era is the final chapter to Taylor's early years. In fact, by the end of the era, she had broken into the film industry. So long as he behaves, we have Drew back in studio to tell us about her acting endeavors. Man, I gotta tell you, this next era was the best time to be a Taylor fan. Not only did she release Red, but she appeared in the 2012 animated movie The Lorax. Funny enough, another movie came out that year called End of Watch featuring Jake Gyllenhaal. Crazy, right? I knew you were trouble, Drew. I really thought you were going to be better that time. This and is be a better man. <laughs> this is the last time we're inviting you up here. Wow, we forced Drew to listen to All Too Well, 10-minute version, and rethink his behavior, I'll take over and recap Taylor's big screen moments. The Grammy Award-winning superstar has been featured on the big screen several times in her career. 
To start off, Taylor's cameo appearance in the Hannah Montana movie is nothing short of iconic. She was featured as an artist performing at a restaurant while Miley slow danced with her teenage heartthrob, Lucas Till. With the insane Ticketmaster battle over her era's tour, it's comical to think about Taylor as an up-and-coming artist, but I think it's sweet how this movie portrays her life long ago when she performed at local restaurants and hoped to get noticed. Continuing on to Taylor's voice acting era, she rocked the role of Audrey in the Lorax movie. I would say this makes sense considering she's comfortable in the recording studio after several albums. In the movie, based on Dr. Seuss' book, Zac Efron and, or played the main character, Ted, who wanted to win Audrey's heart. Though Zac and Taylor denied rumors that they dated in real life after this movie, I think they could have been a total power couple. Taylor was also featured in The Giver as Rosemary. While the one, this one had some critics and Taylor wasn't featured in very many scenes, nothing can be worse than the next movie on the list, Cats. All right, coined a movie that was managed to terrify a generation by an entertainment critic, this film was a complete disaster. Taylor, I know you love your own cats, but that does not mean you had to dress as a horrifying cat in one of the worst movies I can remember. Yikes. While I've loved Taylor since her early days, I must say she should probably stick to singing. While Taylor's success on screen can be debated, her talent in the director's chair is a new and exciting development. This next era is so great that Taylor and the fans lived through it twice. We have Razorback Reels reporter Autumn Klein here to tell us about these two burning red eras. This next era fans seem to know all too well. Red was Taylor Swift's fourth ever studio album when it was released in 2012. She was, of course, 22 at the time Red was released. The iconic fan favorite album heavily references Taylor's three month long relationship with actor Jake Gyllenhaal. Full of heartbreak and expressive lyrics, this album was one I could relate to at 12 years old and still at 23, but in a totally different way. She just knows what she's doing. In 2021, Taylor re-released Red, Taylor's version, just about 10 years after the original dropped. And this re-release was a big one. Already with 20 songs on the original Red, this was a no-skip album for me. But then she gave us Taylor's version with an additional nine vault songs. The original Red featured collaborators like Ed Sheeran and Gary Lightbody, but Taylor's version gave us new guests, including Phoebe Bridgers in the song Nothing New and Chris Stapleton in I Bet You Think About Me. Red, Taylor's version, debuted at number one on the Billboard charts and made Taylor just the second woman with 10 or more number ones in charts history. But it would be treacherous to not mention arguably the most important part of Red's re-release, and that is the 10 minute version of All Too Well that came with the short film we all know and love. I could scream all 10 minutes of this song in my car every day and never get tired of it. The 10 minute version gives us dreamier and more detailed insight into Taylor's relationship with Hall. The short film of the song was completely written and directed by Taylor herself and features Sadie Sink and Dylan O'Brien, who fans speculate represent Taylor and Jake. The film is beautiful and emotional and totally captures the feelings we imagine Taylor had when she was 22 and in love. But that's all I have for Red. Stay, stay, stay around for the rest of Taylor's albums. I'm Autumn Klein reporting for Reels. Thanks for recapping that sad, beautiful, tragic era, Autumn. We really are lucky ones. Okay, Elena, do you think Red is a country album or a pop album? Hot I didn't topic. even know this was a question. It's yeah. a pop album. It's yeah. not a country album. <laughs> Without a doubt, yeah. So, I, like, I really didn't even know right. there was a debate around this. What either. country song is on there? Any of them? No, I know. It does not make sense. So have you seen her film, the 10-minute version? Of course. Do you think I she has a bright future in directing? I, you know, I hope so. Yeah. I love All Too Well, 10-minute version, and I love the short film. Um, we were just chatting about how much we love All Too Well, and to the point that we think about time increments in All Too Well, 10-minute version. Absolutely. Um, but I really hope she has a future in directing. I yeah. mean, I thought it was great. I thought it was wonderful. I completely agree. Are you excited for Speak, Speak Now, Taylor's version? Oh, of course. I, you know, I love all of Taylor Swift's albums, but man, Speak Now is probably in my top three and it's one of my no skip albums and everybody loves Long Live and I love Long Live and I really wish she played it at her, one of her concerts. Completely I'm really sad agree. about it. Yeah. Um, anyway, after the break, we'll be revisiting some eras from our wildest dreams. Are you ready for it?
Welcome back, Swifties. So far, we've covered Taylor's country albums. But we all know that the music industry was forever changed in 2014. We have reluctantly let Drew Chamberlain back in studio to bring us back to the peak of pop culture, the mid-2010s. If you mess this up, Drew, we're going to have bad blood. No, I'm just gonna, sh gonna shake that threat right off and move on. 2014 was the year to be a Taylor fan with her release of one of the most commercially successful pop albums of the 2010s, 1989. Who would have thought that Harry Styles would also drop a successful pop album in 2014 with the release of Four? Both of these artists just have a knack for sticking around the past 10 years dropping great music. No cutoff? Harry never goes out of style. Of course we don't mind. I guess I made it out of the woods then. Harry's daydream look in his eyes is what saved you. But anyway, we have Gigi Kramer here to break down Taylor's breakthrough pop era. 1989 was a music industry changing era. Even after completely switching genres and reworking her public image, Taylor was able to achieve a previously unimaginable level of success. Grab your passport and my hand because I'm about to take you through a recap of the 1989 era. In 1989, Swift trades her guitar ballads and tales of teen heartbreak for 80s-inspired synth pop. While I was and always will be a huge fan of Country Taylor, 1989 was such an important step in her career. Oh, and of course, she also released some iconic music during this time, too. And while I can't cover all the tracks on this album, here's a breakdown of the most popular songs. The lead single for 1989 was Shake It Off, and it definitely set the tone for this era. The song is an empowering dance anthem, and it's absolutely no surprise that it debuted at number one. Moving on, it's absolutely impossible to talk about this era without mentioning Blank Space. Blank Space tackles the image the media had given her, a psycho girlfriend who takes guys in and dumps them at the top drop of a hat. Maybe part of its success can be attributed to one of the most infamous misheard lyrics of all time. Either way, it was a huge hit when it first released, and it's still a hit today, as it's Taylor Swift's most streamed song on Spotify, with over 1.1 billion streams. The last song off this album that I believe had a significant cultural impact was Bad Blood. This song not only took a dig at Katy Perry, but it also gave us an iconic music video full of Taylor's Girl Squad. Taylor had the group of friends that we all wanted, and they seemingly did everything together. Unfortunately, the squad has split, but it was definitely a key part of this era. This era was ultimately one of growth for Taylor. It gave us a whole new style, but it also gave us multiple number one Billboard hits, three Grammy wins, and countless other accolades. To this day, it still remains the most awarded pop album of all time, and is definitely one of my favorites. For Razorback Reels, I'm Gigi Kramer. Thanks, Gigi. 1989 proves that classic pop never goes out of style. Pop may have been a new world for the star, but she's no stranger to award shows. That's right, Riley. We've already mentioned that 1989 won some pretty incredible awards, including three Grammys, but we haven't mentioned any of the other awards Taylor has won. Over the course of her career, Taylor's won a whopping 540 awards. This includes 12 Grammys, 29 Billboard Music Awards, 26 Teen Choice Awards, and 40 American Music Awards. Let's take a look at some of the Grammys Taylor has won. 1989 is one of three albums to win Album of the Year alongside Fearless in 2008 and Folklore in 2021. She's the only female artist to have won Album of the Year three times and only the fourth person in history. Most recently, Taylor Swift walked home with a Grammy in hand for Best Music Video for her iconic All Too Well, the short film. Miss Swift has also taken home her fair share of American Music Awards, totaling 40 wins from only 48 nominations. This makes her the record holder for most AMAs won by a single artist. She's won Artist of the Year seven times, starting in 2009 and most recently in 2022. At the 2022 AMAs, Taylor Swift completely swept, receiving six nominations and walking home with six awards, ranging from favorite country album to favorite pop rock female artist. The awards I've discussed today are barely scratching the surface of Taylor's accolades. So even if you aren't the biggest fan of Taylor Swift, I feel like you have to at least admit that she's an extremely talented artist. Awards aren't the only measure of an artist's success. You really know you've made it when you successfully navigated a media scandal. Sometimes the media can come too much for these delicate celebrities. So in 2016, Taylor took a hiatus, honing or hiding from the public for over a year. This is why we can't have nice things. We have Maddie Phipps in studio to tell us about how Taylor rose up from the dead. Taylor Swift has been the subject of drama for years. The media and other artists have nitpicked her relationships, political views, and artistic choices. 
So in 2017, she released her sixth studio album, Reputation. The album is a direct response to the criticism she has faced over her decade-long career. Reputation has 15 tracks and it is truly a no-skip album. Ready For It is hands down my favorite album opener. This coupled with other dramatic tracks such as Don't Blame Me, I Did Something Bad, and Look What You Made Me Do brought Taylor into a new sonic landscape, electropop. While this is ultimately what the public was introduced to during this era, I think Reputation shines best in its love songs. Taylor started dating Joe Alwyn in 2016. Taylor's relationships have always been an important part of her image and artistry, and Joe is no exception. Songs like Gorgeous, King of My Heart, and Call It What You Want focus on her developing feelings and fears in this new relationship, and I love every minute of it. Taylor closes out the album with a soft ballad, New Year's Day. This delicate yearning track beautifully wraps up this album, and Taylor and the listener move from pained vengefulness to sweet idealism. This era also brought with it iconic looks. This era is associated with dark colors and snake imagery, a bold departure from Swift's all-American girl-next-door persona. I personally think this is the era in which Taylor looks the hottest. I mean, just look at her. This era was accompanied by Taylor's first stadium tour. The Reputation Stadium Tour occurred in 2018 and had 53 shows spanning 36 cities around the world. While this album was initially not well received, I think it's her best and it will always hold a special place in my heart. I can't wait for Reputation Taylor's version and an excuse to revisit my favorite era. For Razorback Reels, I'm Maddie Phipps. Thanks for recapping that dramatic era for us, Maddie. We'd listen to your report over and over and over again if we could. So which era do you think was more powerful of a rebound, Riley? I mean, reputation. I also think like, reputation. I don't think you can really argue that. <laughs> I think that's the All right answer. All of our jaws just dropped to the ground when that one came out. Oh, yeah. And I do think 1989, she really came out of the gate swinging with, yeah. she really did brand herself as a, like, a pop artist. And I think that was something that was really new for her. But I think 19, or I think, excuse me, I think reputation was really where she, uh, she blew up and rebranded herself completely. Yeah, definitely. Would you say that the girl squad was as bad as people made it seem? I really don't know. I just... I don't know. What are your thoughts? I don't, I mean, I would say that all of them, you know, had that appearance. I picture the thing yeah. blowing up in the background. They were the remember. it girls. Yeah. I mean, I think that they were definitely a, an image for sure, but I don't think any of them were bad. And I think they maybe were portrayed as that in the media. So I'm not sure. No. But what would you say, which album addresses her reputation more? Again, I think 100% it's reputation. I mean, it's the, it's the namesake of the album. It's, yes. um, it's what it's really all about. And I just think that, again, I just think this is like such an iconic album. This yeah. is an album that I actually didn't really get into until more recently. And I just, it's so good. I don't that know why concert. I did that. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. That's She's my dream. A performer. You lived my dream if you went <laughs> to that concert. Great. 10 That's, out of 10. Yeah. Highly recommend. <laughs> All right. Well, coming up after the break, we will be covering Miss Americana's Tale of Love and Lore. Stay tuned. <laughs> Budget Eras Tour. For this next era, we'll be trading in our dark lipstick and leather for bright makeup and sequins. After Taylor found her London boy in the Reputation era, she went to write an album full of love. We have Katie Beth Hayda in studio to walk us down a memory lane to Cornelia Street in the Lover era. Taylor Swift released her seventh album in August of 2019. This album was a departure from the dark, heavy, hip-hop influenced tones of Reputation. After taking inspiration from her recalibrated personal life and newfound artistic freedom, she created a bright, uplifting album called Lover. Lover was created as a love letter to love. Taylor Swift has shown her love for love over her years as a songwriter. The album is wildly romantic and seems to track the timeline of a relationship, from its early stages to finally realizing the situation is serious. Lover is full of fan favorite tracks. Cruel Summer documents the flirty, fun, early stages of a relationship, the excited honeymoon phase of discovering new love and there being no rules to a relationship just quite yet. Taylor ends the album with her song Daylight, a dreamy, romantic song. This song is filled with lyrics describing the final stages of finding the one for you. It is filled with passion and assurance, the final words of lover and the final words before saying, I do. But moving a little aside from the storyline of love, the song that caught my attention immediately was The Man. The song deviates from the love story behind the album, but hits most of her listeners in a relatable spot aside from love. And can we talk about the creativity behind the music video? 
I mean, wow. It was powerful and inspiring and brought attention to the reality of what women have to face. It also allows Taylor's fans to have an unfiltered perspective of her rea reality, emphasizing she is still human, just like the rest of us. This album is ultimately the reason I found myself turning into a Swifty. I will always be stuck in my lover era. For Razorback Reels, I'm Katie Beth Hayden. Saying goodbye to the lover era and that wonderful report is truly a death by a thousand cuts. The lover era also came with one of the cruelest summers we never got to witness. Taylor's tours are always iconic and whether or not we got to see them, they are nothing short of wonderful. We have Noah Kim here to recap all of Taylor's tours from eras new and old. Thanks, Elena. Taylor Swift is currently in the midst of her sixth headlining concert tour. It is no surprise that Taylor's vigorous popularity has had an axis shifting effect on society. She was able to transform all of her fans into trust busting Marxists just by simply putting the Eras tour on Ticketmaster. With Eras set to make a projected $591 million in revenue, it is important to look back on Taylor's humble touring or origins back in the good old days when she made a measly $66 million in revenue. Now, Taylor Swift's touring debut happened in 2009. The Fearless tour was Taylor's first impression to hordes of live audiences. Dressed up in a glitzy country getup, Taylor wanted to make her concert feel like a spectacle. Costume changes were abundant and guest stars helped round out this inaugural tour. It only took Taylor two years to return to the live performing scene. The Speak Now tour was favored to make Fearless's profits look like pocket change. Taylor's private jet certainly had its work cut out for itself as she was taking on her first ever world tour. From Singapore to Norway, Taylor upped the ante on all aspects of her performance. We can first see Taylor making her shows unique to each location here as well. Taylor did acoustic covers of songs made by local artists in each city she visited. This time around, Taylor visited 19 different countries. Now as Ty Taylor dialed back her uh, country influence, she also decided to do the same for the country she toured in. The Red Tour, starting in 2013, portrayed a whole new side of Taylor. The Red Concerts took advantage of the stadium setting, and they used the Barnum and Bailey aesthetic to make these performances feel more grandiose. With 12 countries visited and $150 million made, Taylor's Red Tour proved that she had real staying power, no matter the genre. At this point, it was clear that fans across the world were getting down to Taylor's sick beats. The 1989 World Tour continued the trend of bigger and better for Taylor. The guest stars became more eclectic, and Taylor caught the attention of Apple Music and had her first ever concert film produced for this tour. The 1989 World Tour visited 11 countries around the world. Now, Reputation Stadium Tour was an event that awestruck Swifties across the world. The Reputation Tour included many of the things you'd expect from a Taylor Swift concert. Big stages, big guests, big surprises, but of course, Taylor always wants to push the boundaries on what is possible. So for the Reputation Tour, she added big snakes. Taylor may have only visited seven countries for this tour, but, the gen but it also generated $345 million, making it the third highest grossing tour for a female artist. And now we are back in the present day. The current Eras tour would have been Taylor's seventh outing if she did not have her lover tour canceled by uh, extenuating circumstances. In total, Taylor Swift's Eras will place her uh, overall concert revenue just over the one billion mark. Maybe if Taylor toured a couple more times, then she could handle that pesky student loan debt that I know all of y'all are dealing with. Reporting for UA TV, I'm... Thanks, Noah, for that great report. And thank you, Ticketmaster, for being the bane of every Swifties Fish. existence. Before we could be packed together in the biggest stadiums in the country to see one of the biggest stars in the world, we were forced into isolation during the height of the pandemic. This solitude broke many hearts, and things seemed grim. But that all changed when the queen of pop decided she was going to reinvent herself in quarantine, while others frantically cut their hair and picked up a number of, how, a number of now forgotten hobbies. Taylor wrote, produced, and released her next masterpiece. We have Katie Kelly in studio to recap this melancholic era. Folklore is an album filled with romantic and escapist themes Taylor Swift created when the world was stuck in quarantine. Giving no warning, Taylor shocked everyone with the album's release and the songs were very different than the artist's usual pop genre. The songs featured in folklore are described to be a stream of consciousness style with indie characteristics. Now, before we dive into the songs, let's go back in time before the album dropped. 
As COVID-19 was spiking, Taylor decided it was best to cancel her Loverfest shows. Stuck in quarantine, Taylor says that she had watched numerous movies and read many books about a world that doesn't exist anymore. She began to visualize glimpses of stories with different narratives. Allowing herself creative freedom, these stories turned into what we know as folklore. Even though folklore was very different from Taylor's usual style, the album still proved to be successful. During the 63rd Grammy Awards, Taylor won Album of the Year. She even directed and produced a documentary called The Long Pond Studio Sessions, where she performs each song and explains the creative process behind making them. The album has 16 songs, and while all the songs are unique, a couple of them sticks out. The trilogy of Cardigan, August, and Betty shifted Taylor's perspective away from her own, and the iconic track Exile featuring Bon Iver is a beautifully crafted duet showcasing how two lovers can have strikingly different perspectives on the relationship. But my all-time favorite track on the album is The Lakes. This song truly embodies the purpose of folklore. The lyrics, the melody, and the storytelling all encompass that desperate romantic feeling Taylor's trying to create. Overall, Taylor gave her fans what they needed in a time of loneliness, where everyone longed for something more. For Razorback Reels, I'm Katie Kelly. Thanks, Katie. Folklore truly was the perfect record for our collective exile during the pandemic. So Riley, do you think that Lover is overshadowed by folklore? I don't think so. I think they're so different. I think I agree. That the folklore vibe is kind of when you're sad, and then the Lover is like getting yes. right with your friends, driving around. I think it's definitely, fun. you're right, just two completely, completely yeah. different vibes. Um, I, I'm a folklore girly, though. Me What's too. your favorite of the two? I'm just curious. I mean, I would say both of them are for, like I said, different, different vibes, different moves. So I like Lover for Cruel Summer and all those kind of things, but I also like folklore for more of the you know, emo songs yeah. when you're kind of in a funk. But would you say Taylor switched her sound without the, or would she have switched her sound without the pandemic? You know, I really don't know. I feel like the pandemic was a lot of time for a lot of us to reflect on ourselves. Yeah, and I'm sure Taylor Swift agreed with that. Yeah. And she also just, I don't know, had some time on her hands, even yeah. though she said she had a lot going on and she lied. Um, so she was busy during the pandemic. Yeah. I don't know. You know, Taylor is really known for like reinventing herself and reinventing her sound. I really feel like it was bound to happen at some point or another. And I think the pandemic okay. maybe brought that on a little quicker, mm -hmm. but I do think it was generally inevitable. I mean, with the switch with reputation, I would say that yeah. she's possible of reinventing herself. No. It's possible for her too. For sure. Would you say that any of the songs on the Folklore album are actually about her personal life or is she just kind of like, making up some sad stories. No, I think I 100% believe that Taylor takes influence even yeah. from her own life, even when she's writing about these fictional characters. I just, I don't know. I think peace is about her personal life. I really do. Yeah. And I, I don't know. That's just my opinion, though. What do you think? I mean, I would say the same thing. I think probably some of the songs are related to her personal life. She probably takes some inspiration. Yeah. I know she like is a big reader and likes all of those yeah. kind of things, so she pulls some of that. And her writing is just so good, so she probably has to figure out some other way to she get inspiration. She is a lyrical genius. Yeah, of course. <laughs> um, it's time to go to our commercial break, but we'll be returning with the Labyrinth of Taylor's Era soon. Stay tuned. Welcome back. If you're just tuning in, we've reached our final era recap of the evening. We may have no surprises left, but these next two eras were certainly full of them. Surprise dropping one indie folk album would have been crazy enough, but long story short, Taylor did it again. Here to recap the Younger Sister album, we have Ani Olivas in studio. The Folklore and Evermore eras are very intertwined as both were released during the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, Evermore as an era is thought of as the forgotten child of Taylor due to the little to no recognition she gave it after its release. Unlike Folklore, there was no one year anniversary for Evermore, nor any special merch related to the album until the Eras tour was announced. This, of course, was devastating for us Evermore girlies, but we all know that you have to have pretty thick skin to be a fan of Blondie. Taking a look at the songs themselves, Evermore has a similar blend of alternative rock and indie folk to Folklore. However, I think Evermore stands alone in truly showcasing Taylor's affinity and talent for writing ballads. Songs Champagne Problems, Tolerate It, Ivy, and Marjorie give the album Taylor's signature 
heart-wrenching melancholy, with the last being dedicated to her late grandmother. There's a slight shift in gears with track number six, Nobody No Crime, featuring Haim, and I like to think of this song as a little treat for those of us who are a little nostalgic for Taylor's Country Days with the feature of a harmonica track. My favorite on the album, however, is hands down the 11th track, Cowboy Like Me, in which two cons try to take advantage of one another, but fall in love instead. That is a trope I will never get tired of. And last but not least, Evermore ends with the inspirational It's Time to Go, which alludes to the controversy over her masters being sold. While Taylor describes Evermore as Folklore's younger sister, I think that the younger sister should take her time to shine. I'm Anais Olivas for Razorback Reels. Thank you, Ani, for giving us closure on this wonderful era. Drew, it's time to go, remember? We said no more reports on her exes. No, it's the, I, I'm the problem, it's me, but I can't believe Joe Alwyn left. <laughs> Lavender Hayes. Hey, it's okay, Drew. Karma will always be her boyfriend. As we enter our 11th hour here at Reels, we have Lily Barcroft in studio to recap the Mastermind's latest era. What time is it? Midnight? Perfect. I'm Lily Barcroft here to talk about Taylor Swift's latest album, Midnight's. The singer-songwriter announced the album, Midnight's, at the 2022 AMAs. She wore a bejeweled crystal mini dress and her signature red lip. This album marks her first original album since Evermore. The album was released with 13 songs representing 13 sleepless nights throughout Taylor's life. But at 3 a.m. the night of the release, it was extended with seven more. Personally, I like the 3 a.m. version better. The album garnered over 180 million streams in its first 24 hours, breaking Spotify's first day streaming record previously held by Bad Bunny. Taylor had major success with her singles Antihero, Bejeweled, and Lavender Haze. Each had a music video that had the signature storytelling Taylor is famous for. My personal favorite had to be the Bejeweled music video. Her costumes were perfect for the sparkly songs theme. This album garnered a lot of attention on social media, starting a bunch of trends on TikTok, including her songs, Mastermind, You're On Your Own Kid, and of course, Bejeweled. Most recently, Taylor has split from her boyfriend, Joe Alwyn, and Alwyn was actually a writer on many of her albums under the name William Bowery, including Midnight's. They wrote the song Sweet Nothing together, detailing a loving relationship. Will this be the last time we hear about their love story? See what I did there? <laughs> I am anxiously waiting to see how this unfolds and if we get another album out of this. I wonder if her next album will dive into another genre. Many fans assumed that Midnight's would have a 70s feel to it, but were disappointed when she released another pop album. I'm hoping that Taylor tries out pop rock before she retires. Maybe the next installment in her discography will make my dream come true. <laughs> this has been Lily Barcroft for Razorback Reels. Thanks, Lily. We'll never get tired of listening to reports on our favorite anti-hero. Riley, I have a question. Okay. Do you think that Evermore is the most forgotten era? Personally, no. Evermore is like my road trip song. Okay. Like when I'm by myself, I'm wanting to kind of have a little moment. I yeah. play Evermore and Folklore. I feel like those are the two. But out of Folklore and Evermore, I would say Evermore is like the lesser known. I do. I think it's like the um, the like ugly stepchild a little bit between the <laughs> yeah. two. That like she's just like. Really similar. I mean, there is always that running joke that Taylor Swift doesn't like Evermore, yeah. but. Did you expect Midnight's to be a pop album? Um, I would say I expected it to be like something different because she's done basically everything. So I was personally predicting it would be a rock album. Okay, that's what oh, I, I think remember that was talking amazing. about this. I yeah. think she would do such a great job at rock. I feel like she could rebrand herself again and do that whole thing that she usually does. Um, but I feel like Midnight's, honestly, even the title would have worked for a rock album. So that's why I was kind of leaning yes. towards that. But do you think, okay, going back to Joe, mm -hmm. you know, the hot yes. topic, do you think that Taylor and Joe are still together? Nope. <laughs> I don't really? think they're... Okay, give us your evidence. Okay. Let's hear it. So my evidence is that she has a really good relationship with Good Morning America and Good Morning America promoted it. I mean, she's okay, used Good Morning true. America to release her newest albums and things like that. They just have a really, really good relationship, I think, in mm -hmm. years past. And I think that it would be pretty crazy for Good Morning America to report on it and them still be together. I think that would be pretty crazy. But did you see she was wearing the J necklace? 
I saw it that. It could have been like from a while okay, ago. Okay, I thought I that she was, that. I saw like something that she was wearing the J necklace, but mm -hmm. whenever I saw the pictures, it didn't look like the J necklace to me. It looked like, the, okay, this is crazy, but it looked like the clasps were different sizes. Like it looked like the clasps mm -hmm. for her real necklace versus her J necklace were different sizes. Pay attention <laughs> to the details, I, I love okay, it. Okay, well, I see TikToks about it, that's so it. I'm not doing my, my own crazy my research. research I just see other people's crazy research yeah. and then I, you know. Invest it. That completely and I, makes sense. I yeah. mean, who really knows? We'll find out eventually. I feel like she'll say something. Really? I don't think she'll ever address it. I think ever? that's not Taylor's style. When has she really? ever, other than on the Ellen show with Joe Jonas, has she like talked about a breakup publicly? Other than True. in her songs You're and right. through her music. And oh, I just don't we'll think see that's her style next anymore. Album, maybe. We'll I know. See. Oh yeah. Well, with ten different eras spanning across seventeen years in the industry, Taylor Swift has given us some great music. And with the release of new music comes music videos. For our final trip down memory lane, we have Connor Marsh in studio to break down the best videos from each of Taylor's eras. Thanks, Elena. Taylor has released 45 music videos over her career, but only one from each era can be the winner. Starting off with her debut album, I'm giving the best music video to our song. It starts with Taylor sitting on the floor in the most early 2000s outfit I've ever seen, by the way, talking on a vintage pink rotary phone. My personal favorite part of the video is Taylor sat in a colorful flower field. Taylor's twang on this song really adds to the country feel of the video. It's crazy to think that Taylor started this way in music, moving all the way back to 2007. Moving on to Fearless, it's a toss up between Love Story and You Belong With Me. While I do love the Romeo and Juliet feel of Love Story, I've gotta give it to You Belong With Me. This is one of Taylor's most iconic videos of all time. The opening scene of her talking through the window with her notebook has been recreated countless times. Taylor acting the part of a nerdy band kid with a crush on a football player as well as the cheerleader who keeps interrupting them is so fun. It feels very a Cinderella story with Chad Michael Murray and Hilary Duff. I'll never forget this music video and it's why You Belong With Me is my favorite from Fearless. While Speak Now doesn't have the best music videos in my opinion, Mean is still a classic. Taylor sings about getting back at her bullies and how one day she'll be, quote, big enough so you can't hit me. The ending sees Swift performing on a Broadway stage. Mean has always been one of my favorite Speak Now songs, and this video takes the cake. Now, Red gave us some really great videos, but my favorite's got to be 22. First of all, this is one of Taylor's most iconic and recognizable looks of all time. The black hat, heart sunglasses, and her famous not a lot going on at the moment shirt. The video was filmed on a vintage Polaroid style camera, which really fits that 2012 Tumblr aesthetic. 22 is such a banger, and this music video is pure perfection. 1989 is hands down the best era for music videos, so this was really, really hard to pick a favorite. I ultimately decided to go with Style. Not only is this one of Taylor's best songs, but it's one of her best music videos as well. Visually, it's so interesting. The saturation, bold colors, and a contrasting hue create a surreal atmosphere. The silhouette visuals have to be my favorite part of the video though. 1989 is my favorite era for a reason and this video highlights its greatness. Now reputation came at the height of the Taylor Swift hate train so she clapped back in full force with this era. While the videos perfectly encapsulate the album, my favorite is ready for it. This video depicts Taylor's public perception at the time of reputation. The hooded Taylor shielding herself from society and the cyborg Taylor being her true self. Her bionic form ultimately defeats her public persona, allowing the real Taylor to emerge. That's why the Ready For It video best represents reputation as an era. Taylor proved that she could come back stronger than ever. Now, in my opinion, Lover is a really underrated era altogether, and the music videos are so cool. It was hard to pick, but I had to go with The Man. The Man depicts a powerful and rich businessman named Tyler Swift. He's shown manspreading on a subway, on a private yacht with models, and getting angry at a tennis match. Oh, and Tyler's played by Taylor, just for clarification. This video's message is pretty clear. Taylor's lyrics speak about gender inequalities and challenges viewers to question their own biases. Now, because Folklore released during the height of the pandemic, it, not, it only has one music video. My pick's gotta be Cardigan. After entering through her gold piano portal, Taylor is transported to a magical forest where she sings about the power of memories. The cardigan Taylor wears is a symbol of her past and the attachment to her lost love. Cardigan may be the only video from Folklore, but it's still one of my all-time favorites. Releasing just five months after Folklore, Evermore also got the one music video treatment. Willow follows the Cardigan video with Taylor entering through her magic piano into the forest, although this time we see a new love story play out. 
Taylor journeys through the forest to find her true love, but the couple is kept apart. Willow shows Taylor's determination to not only find love, but herself in the process. We only have three music videos so far for Midnight's, but all three are great. Antihero and Lavender Haze are good, but I decided to go with Bejeweled. The Bejeweled music video tells a classic Cinderella story, with a special appearance by Haim as Taylor's evil stepsisters and Laura Dern as the stepmother. I love the imagery with all the diamonds. Taylor looks especially beautiful in this video. She gets a lesson from burlesque icon Dita Von Teese, and the two perform a cocktail duet together. In the end, Taylor meets her prince, Jack Antonoff, and the two live happily ever after, until she ghosts him. I'm a sucker for a classic fairy tale story, and the Bejeweled music video is just that. Well, this has been fun revisiting all of Taylor's eras. Reporting for Razorback Reels, I'm Connor Marsh. Thanks, Connor. What a way to wrap up this Taylor Swift spectacular. That's all the time we have for tonight. I hope all of the Swifties at home love the show. I'm Riley Atkinson. And I'm Elena Thompson. Have a great night.